In the Latin language of the ancient Roman Empire, castra were buildings or plots of land reserved for or constructed for use as a military defensive position. The word appears in both Oscan and Umbrian as well as in Latin. In classical Latin the word castra means great legionary encampment and included marching, temporary, and fortified permanent ones while the diminutive form castellum was used for the smaller forts, which were usually, but not always, occupied by the auxiliary units and used as logistic bases for the legions, as explained by Vegetius. A generic term is praesidium. The terms stratopedon and Florian were used by Greek language authors in order to designate the Roman castra and the Roman castellum respectively. In English, the terms Roman fortress, Roman fort, and Roman camp are commonly used for the castra. However, scholastic convention tends toward the use of the word camp, marching camp, and fortress as a translation of castra, and the use of the word fort as a translation of castellum. These conventions are usually followed and found in scholarly works. Etymology According to Julius Pocorni, and Dogomanitius Etymologistus Wotabuch, page 586 under Kess, Oscan Castrus and Umbrian Castruo. Castravuf have the same original meaning as castrum, which was an estate, or a tract of land, being the term used to designate a private estate. In Latin the word castrum was probably then the term for an estate or a tract of land enclosed by a fence or a wooden or stone wall of some kind, as seems to be used in a few passages in Cornelius Nepus' works. The American Heritage Dictionary, following Julius Pocorni, lists asterisk kes, cut, as the root. One castrum was a reservation of land cut off for military use. It could be an entire base, such as Castrum Mogenshikum, or it could be a single fortified building. From the latter use came the English word castle. In Latin the term castrum is much more frequently used as a proper name for geographical locations, e.g., Castrum album, Castrum inui, Castrum novum, Castrum truentinum, Castrum virgium. Castra in the plural refers to a collection of structures. Considering that the earliest structures were tents, which were cut out of hide or cloth, one castrum may well be a tent, with the plural meaning tents. All but the most permanent bases housed the men in barracks of tents placed in quadrangles and separated by numbered streets. The term castra then means marching camp, temporary camp, permanent camp, fortified camp and fortress, always designating a great legionary encampment. The plural was also used as a place name of as Castra Cornelia, and from this come the Welsh place name prefix Caia, and English suffixes Caster and Chester, e.g., Winchester, Lancaster. The commonest Latin syntagmata for the term Castra are Castra Stativa, Permanent Camp Fortress, Castra Estiva, Summer Camp Fortress, Castra Hibernae. Winter Camp, Fortress, Castra Navalia or Castra Inautica, Navy Camp, Fortress, Castra Amphilius was one of names used by the Emperor Caligula and then also by other emperors. Castro, also derived from Castrum, is a common Spanish family name, as well as a place name in Spain and Spanish-speaking countries. Italy and the Balkan, either by itself or in various compounds such as Argyro Castro. Types of Castra The best known type of Castra is the camp, a military town designed to house and protect the soldiers and their equipment and supplies when they were not fighting or marching. Regulations required a major unit in the field to retire to a properly constructed camp every day. As soon as they have marched into an enemy's land, they do not begin to fight until they have walled their camp about, nor is the fence they raise rashly made, or uneven, nor do they all abide ill it, nor do those that are in it take their places at random, but if it happens that the ground is uneven, it is first leveled. Their camp is also four square by measure, and carpenters are ready, in great numbers, with their tools. 
to erect their buildings for them. To this end a marching col imported the equipment needed to build and stock the camp in a baggage train of wagons and on the backs of the soldiers. Camps were the responsibility of engineering units to which specialists of many types belonged, officered by architecture, chief engineers, who requisitioned manual labor from the soldiers at large as required. They could throw up a camp under enemy attack in as little as a few hours. Tertia Castra, Corta Castra, etc., a camp of three days, four days, etc. More permanent camps were Castra Stativa, standing camps. The least permanent of these were Castra Estiva or East Avalia, summer camps, in which the soldiers were housed sub pelibus or sub tentoriasa, under tents. Summer was the campaign season. For the winter the soldiers retired to Castra Hiberne containing barracks and other buildings of more solid materials, with timber construction gradually being replaced by stone. The camp allowed the Romans to keep a rested and supplied army in the field. Neither the Celtic nor Germanic armies had this capability. They found it necessary to disperse after only a few days. Plan of the Fort Sources and origins Even from the most ancient times Roman camps were constructed according to a certain ideal pattern, formally described in two main sources, the Demetationa Castrarum or Demunitionibus Castrarum by either Hyginus Grammaticus or pseudo Hyginus, and the works of Polybius. Vegetius has a small section on entrenched camps as well. The terminology varies some but the basic plan is the same. The hypothesis of an Etruscan origin is a viable alternative. Lay out the ideal enforced a linear plan for a camp or fort. A square for camps to contain one legion or smaller unit, a rectangle for two legions, each legion being placed back to back with headquarters next to each other. Laying it out was a geometric exercise conducted by experienced officers called metators who used graduated measuring rods called decempedi and grammatici who used a groma, a sighting device consisting of a vertical staff with horizontal cross pieces and vertical plumb lines. Ideally the process started in the center of the planned camp at the site of the headquarters tent or building. Streets and other features were marked with colored pennants or rods. Wall and ditch the castra special structure were also defended from attacks. The base was placed entirely within the vallum, which could be constructed under the protection of the legion in battle formation if necessary. The vallum was quadrangular aligned on the cardinal points of the compass. The construction crews dug a trench, throwing the excavated material inward, to be formed into the rampart. On top of this a palisade of stakes was erected. The soldiers had to carry these stakes on the march. Over the course of time, the palisade might be replaced by a fine brick or stone wall, and the ditch serve also as a moat. A legion-sized camp always placed towers at intervals along the wall with positions between for the division artillery. Interval around the inside periphery of the vallum was a clear space, the intervallum, which served to catch enemy missiles as an access route to the vallum and as a storage space for cattle and plunder. Legionaries were quartered in a peripheral zone inside the intervallum, which they could rapidly cross to take up position on the vallum. Inside of the legionary quarters was a peripheral road, the Via Sagularis, probably a type of service road, as the sagum, a kind of cloak, was the garment of soldiers. Streets, gates and central plaza every camp included, Main Street, which ran unimpeded through the camp in a north-south direction and was very wide. The names of streets in many cities formerly occupied by the Romans suggest that the street was called Cardo or Cardis Maximus. This name applies more to cities than it does to ancient camps. Typically, Main Street was the Via Principalis. The central portion was used as a parade ground and headquarters area. The headquarters building was called the Praetorium because it housed the Praetor or base commander and his staff. 
In the camp of a full legion he held the rank of consul or proconsul, but officers of lesser ranks might command. On one side of the praetorium was the quaestorium, the building of the supply officer, or quaestor. On the other side was the forum, a small duplicate of an urban forum, where public business could be conducted. Along the Via Principalis were the homes or tents of the several tribunes in front of the barracks of the units they commanded. The Via Principalis went through the Vallum in the Porta Principalis Dextra and Porta Principalis Sinistra, which were gates fortified with turris, which was on the north and which on the south depends on whether the Praetorium faced east or west, which remains unknown. The central region of the Via Principalis with the buildings for the command staff was called the Principia. It was actually a square, as across this at right angles to the Via Principalis was the Via Praetoria, so called because the Praetorium interrupted it. The Via Principalis and the Via Praetoria offered another division of the camp into four quarters. Across the central plaza to the east or west was the main gate, the Porta Praetoria. Marching through it and down Headquarters Street, a unit ended up in formation in front of the headquarters. The standards of the Legion were located on display there, very much like the flag of modern camps. On the other side of the Praetorium the Via Praetoria continued to the wall, where it went through the Porta di Comana. In theory this was the back gate. Supplies were supposed to come in through it and so it was also called, descriptively, the Porta Quaestoria. The term decumena, of the tenth, came from the arranging of manipuli or terma from the first to the tenth, such that the tenth was near the intervallum on that side. The via praetoria on that side might take the name via decumena or the entire via praetoria be replaced with decumanus maximus. Canteen in peaceful times the camp set up a marketplace with the natives in the area. They were allowed into the camp as far as the units numbered five. There another street crossed the camp at right angles to the Via di Comana, called the Via Quintana, 5th Street. If the camp needed more gates, one or two of the Porta Quintana were built, presumably named Dextra and Sinistra. If the gates were not built, the Porta di Comana also became the Porta Quintana. At 5th Street, a public market was allowed. Major buildings the Via Quintana and the Via Principalis divided the camp into three districts. The Latra Praetorii, the Pretentura and the Retentura. In the latter were the Ara, the Augeratorium, the Tribunal, where courts martial and arbitrations were conducted, the guardhouse, the quarters of various kinds of staff and the storehouses for grain or meat. Sometimes the Horia were located near the barracks and the meat was stored on the hoof. Analysis of sewage from latrines indicates the legionary diet was mainly grain. Also located in the latter was the armamentarium, a long shed containing any heavy weapons and artillery not on the wall. The pretentura contained the scamnum legatorum, the quarters of officers who were below general but higher than company commanders. Near the Principia were the Valitudinarium, Veterinarium, Fabrica, and further to the front the quarters of special forces. These included Classici, Equites, Explorators, and Vexillaria. Troops who did not fit elsewhere also were there. The part of the Retentura closest to the Principia contained the Quaestorium. By the late empire it had developed also into a safe keep for plunder and a prison for hostages and high-ranking enemy captives. Near the Quaestorium were the quarters of the headquarters guard, who amounted to two centuries. If the imperator was present they served as his bodyguard. Barracks further from the Quaestorium were the tents of the nationists, who were auxiliaries of foreign troops, and the legionaries themselves in double rows of tents or barracks. One striga was as long as required and 18 meters wide. In it were two hemistrigia of facing tents centered in its 9 meters strip. Arms could be stacked before the tents and baggage carts kept there as well. Space on the other side of the tent was for passage. In the northern places like Britain, where it got cold in the winter, they would make wood or stone barracks. The Romans would also put a fireplace in the barracks. They had about three bunk beds in it. 
They had a small room beside it where they put their armor. It was as big as the tents. They would also make these barracks if the fort they had was going to stay there for good. A tent was 3 by 3.5 meters, 10 men per tent. Ideally a company took 10 tents, arranged in a line of 10 companies, with the tent near the Porta di Comana. Of the sea, 9.2 square meters of bunk space each man received 0.9, or about 0.6 by 1.5 meters, which was only practical if they slept with heads to the aisle. The single tent with its men was called contubernium, also used for squad. A squad during some periods was eight men or fewer. The Centuri Alp or company commander had a double-sized tent for his quarters, which served also as official company area. Other than there, the men had to find other places to be. To avoid mutiny, it became extremely important for the officers to keep them busy. A covered portico might protect the walkway along the tents. If barracks had been constructed, one company was housed in one barracks building, with the arms at one end and the common area at the other. The company area was used for cooking and recreation, such as gaming. The army provisioned the men and had their bread baked in outdoor ovens, but the men were responsible for cooking and serving themselves. They could buy meals or supplementary foods at the canteen. The offices were allowed servants. Sanitation for sanitary facilities. A camp had both public and private latrines. A public latrine consisted of a bank of seats situated over a channel of running water. One of the major considerations for selecting the site of a camp was the presence of running water, which the engineers diverted into the sanitary channels. Drinking water came from wells, however, the larger and more permanent bases featured the aqueduct a structure or running a stream captured from high ground into the camp. The Praetorium had its own latrine, and probably the quarters of the high-ranking offices. In or near the intervallum, where they could easily be accessed, were the latrines of the soldiers. A public bathhouse for the soldiers, also containing a latrine, was located near or on the Via Principalis territory. The influence of a base extended far beyond its walls. The total land required for the maintenance of a permanent base was called its territoria. In it were located all the resources of nature and the terrain required by the base. Pastures, woodlots, water sources, stone quarries, mines, exercise fields and attached villages. The central castra might also support various fortified adjuncts to the main base, which were not in themselves self-sustaining. In this category were speculi, watchtowers, castella, small camps, and naval bases. All the major bases near rivers featured some sort of fortified naval installation, one side of which was formed by the river or lake. The other sides were formed by a polygonal wall and ditch constructed in the usual way, with gates and watchtowers. The main internal features were the boat sheds and the docks. When not in use, the boats were drawn up into the sheds for maintenance and protection. Since the camp was placed to best advantage on a hill or slope near the river, the naval base was usually outside its walls. The classici and the optionus of the naval installation relied on the camp for its permanent defense. Naval personnel generally enjoyed better quarters and facilities. Many were civilians working for the military. Modifications in practice This ideal was always modified to suit the terrain and the circumstances. Each camp discovered by archaeology has its own specific layout and architectural features, which make sense from a military point of view. If, for example, the camp was built on an outcrop, it followed the lines of the outcrop. The terrain for which it was best suited and for which it was probably designed in distant prehistoric times was the rolling plain. The camp was best placed on the summit and along the side of a low hill, with spring water running in rivulets through the camp and pastureland to provide grazing for the animals. In case of attack, arrows, javelins and sling missiles could be fired down at an enemy tiring himself to come up. For defense troops could be formed in an assise, or battle line, outside the gates, where they could be easily resupplied and replenished as well as being supported by archery from the palisade.
the streets, gates and buildings present depended on the requirements and resources of the camp. The gates might vary from two to six and not be centered on the sides. Not all the streets and buildings might be present. Quadrangular camps in later times Many settlements in Europe originated as Roman military camps and still show traces of their original pattern. The pattern was also used by Spanish colonizers in America following strict rules by the Spanish monarchy for founding new cities in the New World. Many of the towns of England still retain forms of the word castra in their names, usually as the suffixes caster or chester, Lancaster, Colchester, Tadcaster, Chester, Manchester, Manceter, Utoxeter and Ribchester, for example. Castle has the same derivation, from the diminutive Casta Moor, Little Fort, but does not always indicate a former Roman camp.